And that takes us to our last album. Uh, I get to do the bio on this one, but to, to create a little buffer, uh, Josh, you want to run the numbers first before I go full bio? Yes. Haircut 100, often spelled out as 100, but also seen as the number 100. They, uh, the album is Pelican West, released in 1982. It is number 1,356 in the 80s. It is uh, 147 in 1982. And the band is ranked 5,592 in the overall artist rankings. Yeah, you got to love when you go to, you know, the first couple places you go to for a bio. Yeah. And at All Music, it was one paragraph <laughs> along right. the way. Um, and so you're, it's like, okay, got to do a deeper, uh, deeper dive here. And here's a little bit of what I was able to cobble together. Um, uh, the band was, the band, sort of the first two members, like many of the bands we cover, there's a couple people that have been making music together, right? And then they pick up the, I always imagine it like, like, you know, one of those kids movies where there's a couple friends and they decide they have to fight something, right? And they pick up other mm -hmm. kids, like the Mighty Ducks or something, you know, yes. like they, they pick up, they've got Getting the core people. Together. Yeah. And then some other people who are not, wouldn't be their friends, but yeah, they create the gang, right? Right. Are there. So in this case, the initial gang is uh, Les Nemes and Nick Hayward. Um, and they've been sort of gigging together in bands since the late 70s. Um, they, some of the band names I was able to come across were like Boat Party and <laughs> Captain Pennyworth were two of the names I came across. So b Boat Party, I don't, I don't know about those. I think Haircut 100, Josh has uh, criticized the name, but I, I don't know if Haircut 100 was any worse than those two. So That's probably um, true, yeah. Yeah, they, they, uh, they end up in London and in 1980 specifically and they uh they're joined by a uh, guitar player graham jones who becomes the third member of the group and they get to the name haircut 100 just uh workshop and names <laughs> in uh, in nick's parents living room is kind of where it's there they eventually add a drummer patrick hunt they get a manager they record some demos and uh, at one point, they have a percussionist and a saxophonist uh, at different points, and they end up getting uh, signed by Arista Records in 1981. Um, and they record their debut single, Favorite Shirts, Boy Meets Girl, in parentheses, which ends up on the UK Top 10 Hits and is their first of four UK top 10 singles, hmm. which I thought interesting. It's a uh, case you're wondering, Josh, it's favorite shirts, boy meets girl, love plus one, nobody's fool and fantastic day okay. are the ones that are there. Uh, were you able to catch how many of those tracks were on album number one? Uh, all of them. Fav <laughs> all of them. Yes. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> this was their biggest album by sure. Uh, it, um, it's released in January, 1982. And uh, it reaches number two on the UK albums chart. So I think at the beginning, we're like, I don't know much about them. Like they, they had a moment in Britain, you know what I mean? Yep. Where they were a pretty big band. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it didn't really lead to US success. Um, they did get uh, Love Plus One into the US top 40. Yep. I think that's the song you probably recognize, yes. right? And I, and I did as well when yep. I, I listened to it. Uh, they toured pretty consistently, but unfortunately... In late 1982, the dreaded tensions within the band oh, comes geez. in. And uh, Hayward eventually starts refusing to attend recording sessions. They release a single in early 83 that, actually, I shouldn't say release. It actually gets canceled, <laughs> the single. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they're they talking about going solo. I think it comes out that members of the band, once again, true 80s cliche, uh, were struggling with some... Uh, drugs and mental health issues i don't want to disparage there are some um there are some folks that say the drugs was not a piece of it it was more mental health along the way so i please do not quote me on that but there's different things that are going in and the band breaks up unfortunately um they do reunite in 2004 uh more than 20 years after they break up 
and they reunited for the show Bands Reunited on VH1. You remember that show <laughs> where a guy went around trying to reunite the bands? Oh, And then they yeah. play a show at the end. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. And, and notoriously, they tried to... The one I always remember is they were trying to reunite the Smiths for the season finale. <laughs> and both Morrissey and Johnny Marr told them to literally fuck off. And they got in like... <laughs> You know, Mike Joyce and um, Andy Rorick, right, who were on board. And then, like, Johnny Marr and Morrissey are just not having it. You know what I mean? And they just keep saying, like, anyway, that just is a memory that's there. But, yes, they reunite for bands, reunite it, and perform Love Plus One and Fantastic Day. Um, I think also in in something that's, uh, as the kids would say, wholesome. Uh, yes. they, they don't tour. And then they, they actually... Um, it's, it was reported in multiple things. I, right now I'm reading off of Wikipedia, but I did read this in multiple other things. They ended up rekindling their friendship and bandship on Facebook. So that wow. falls down to the, along with maybe helping the Orange Revolution, right? In like, <laughs> in like Russia, one yeah. of only two good things Facebook ever did <laughs> is yes. basically bring together the members of Haircut 100. So, um, and they end up playing a gig together. Uh, on January 28th, 2011, where they perform this album in its entirety and then release it as a CD. So, um, and they basically say that they're now back on good terms, even though they haven't recorded in a while. So happy, happy story. And they're all alive, my friend. All of them, including the members who were in and out of the band, like, you know, uh, the saxophonist Phil Smith and uh one of the percussionists blair cunningham and stuff like that so they're all around so that's also good news so good vibes yeah. all along the way so that's a little bit of a, a a brief sketch of the band josh what were your thoughts on this album well i mean good vibes is a, a really good place to start with this album and yeah man and wholesome is a is an also a very appropriate uh word to describe them that's the kind of whole aesthetic of them um, listening to this uh, album it's very sunny sounding and happy there's no real dark kind of themes or or um, sounds on this album no no kind could of you... <laughs> depressing <laughs> depressing no. synth or anything like that on here could you tell and 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 by the way this is a factual statement so could you tell as quickly as i did uh which band that we've recently covered deeply influenced this band because I made the connection like literally about three minutes in and it never went away. So, uh, well, Talking Heads came came to mind. Okay, is that, that is a good. One. That's not who I immediately okay. thought of, but I can see that for sure. Who? Tell me who you were thinking of. Oh, Orange Juice for sure. Oh, yes. And I, like I listen to this, I'm like, this is a continuation of Orange Juice, and then I read, and they're like heavily influenced by Orange Juice. I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, that, that, that's on point. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, no, no wonder I I did really enjoy this album and I, I enjoyed the orange juice album as well uh, the they're definitely a new wave band they seem to take a lot of uh interestingly influence from maybe like brazilian or latin music uh they have congas uh well let's here. take a look at influences josh that's yes. always a good thing <laughs> okay, right go so it. related artists that's always a good thing so do we want to go with in so in all music they have influenced by it has one group josh orange juice <laughs> so and similar to abc how about that okay right yeah spandau ballet the thompson twins them, yeah. mm-hmm. and a band called china crisis which oh wow that's the only one of the four i don't know okay so so there you go that's who's in there but i don't mean to keep cutting you off I'll no no for a while now. They, I, I definitely kind of got a a latin vibe to it or maybe like bossa nova or something they seem to have uh, along with the the congas, there seem to be uh, in the horns. There is a a danceable quality to it. It's almost like a at times like a sped up salsa beat or something. Uh, there's a real like almost like Caribbean or island vibe I got from this as well. There, it's a very smooth. Um, all of the. Uh, songs kind of really have positive um <laughs> positive meanings to them you know fantastic day is kind of a perfect uh, uh, example of that but then you know nothing offensive in a song called baked bean and 
uh, love, love got me in triangles. So they're kind of well, like orange juice. They're kind of throwing a little bit of everything into different songs. Um, I heard some funk and R and B and love, love got me in triangles and um, uh, some, maybe some jazz influence and uh, love plus one, which I heard. I feel like vampire weekend, you know, we name check them last week or the week before i feel like they probably heard mm-hmm. this album at some point they're kind well, of akin what, in some way yeah, matt compared orange juice to them yeah so yeah it makes sense so, yeah so english if, beat was another group that we covered that okay. i think there's some there's some overlap with at times too yeah i think the mm-hmm. you know getting back to the uk uh reggae influence i think that definitely plays a role in some of these new wave bands that we're hearing that there's some underlying uh, dna to to something that it's in reggae that they like or or in ska that they take from those and incorporate into their sound but yeah, um, milk film has like <laughs> yeah. all your positive glad i live am i glad that the sky is blue glad for the country lanes glad for the fall of dew yep <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah i mean you keep waiting for like where the subversive twit there's none so there's I mean, none. it's nice yeah it's it's very pleasant music and um they are they are kind of tight as a band same thing i said with orange juice and and uh yeah i i really enjoyed this band and um it's a it's it is my pick of the week i i liked it the most of all all three of these albums i don't disagree yeah i i really love the start of this album the song favorite shirts boy meets girl is one of Mm -hmm. my favorite tracks we've done in the 80s so far i'd go so far as to say Uh, love plus one was immediately familiar uh and then lemon fire brigade i i like those three quite a bit uh another one that i really like from if you want to hear like smooth rock done well in a way that doesn't kind of make you agitated (laughs) like love's got me in triangles Mm -hmm. is is a lane where i really enjoyed that Uh, there's a track later called calling captain autumn that i thought was really interesting that has sort of like this like boom you know like sort of like funky bass line along the way and i did see they had a song called boat party Um, (laughs) so they do bring it back to uh their original name which i so, thought was kind of comical yeah. yeah so the original album was the the first 12 tracks covering the um ending in calling captain autumn and then they re-released the album later on called pelican west plus that had those bonus tracks with with boat party and ski club and some mm-hmm. alternate versions or, or 12 inch versions of songs but and so, it's a yeah. testament to how much i like this album that i i knew it ended at 12 and oh, then i listened okay. to all 17 because yeah. i i consciously made a decision i'm like i want to see what keeps going and then i stumbled across boat party and ski club where it's all <laughs> yeah. this fun it's like let's do a different location for a vacation so yeah hilarious what was the favorite shirts 12 inch version like i didn't listen to that to end the album um i mean <laughs> not so different you yeah. know what i mean it's 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 like stretched out more. It's so okay. like instead of like instead of dun, 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 it's where like dun, 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 you know it's <laughs> kind of cover just, more you know, vinyl. <laughs> yeah, inch. but the the boss the bossa nova thing is a really interesting uh, pull, Josh, because yeah, there is there is that what we call the world music uh, mm-hmm. element. That I mean, I get where you get the the um, talking heads from because something like King Size, you're my little steam yep. whistle, sounds like, and so does Favorite Shirts, Boy Meets Girl. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's i think it's a little bit more pop sensible uh it's actually kind of shocking to me that this music didn't cross over more in the in the u.s because it seems like these would be radio singles and so Mm -hmm. it makes sense that there's top 10 singles here because these are singles that would be easy to play on the radio and for sure you know in that like three minute no longer than four minute mark as well so yeah this was a a nice little gem and it's um it's i'm finding that there's a there's a whole group of bands i don't know very well but that are playing this type of music like sort of um world music reggae infused it's got a little bit of funk in it but it's it's definitively like abc and orange juice and you know and and pushing it out like what the talking heads were doing like we said before um that I, i really like I, I've kind of joked before that I don't like what I call world music, but I, I think I just wasn't exposed to it done in a way that didn't seem like cliched or hacky or, or like put upon kind of. This seems much more organic and natural, mm. I think, where it doesn't seem as if someone's appropriating. It seems more as if they're um, 
it's like a homage, but not in like a cut, co- like a cover version. Right. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. It's, it, yeah. and it seems to be predominantly kind of these, this subculture of UK artists <laughs> that, that, you know, and, or, orange juice and all these bands, you know, not talking heads accepted, but, but uh, yeah, they, we keep discovering these, these little bands. And I never realized that when I say world music, I'm largely referring primarily to the percussion. Right. Uh, and there's horns is the second part of it, but there's plenty of music I listen to with horns. I don't think it was world music, but the definitive part of what I, and Matt asked me, you know, what is world music, John? And I kind of have, I kind of have to say when there's non, non um, rock music, um, drum kit percussion, I think sometimes I will classify some of that or, or synthetic drums, you know, yes. drum machine type drums. I think that's when sometimes I, may too quickly but like reflectively call it world music because the percussion operates outside and that's kind of what when we're saying there's world music elements i think what i'm saying is it's the way the horns are being played the way that they're the percussion Mm -hmm. a more frantic percussion um syncopatic percussion um that's i think what i'm referring to and that is that is a a piece of the album but there's also guitar on this album Mm-hmm. Um, and there wasn't as much guitar in the other album, so it was a welcome thing this week to have an album that had some guitar on it and bass. Yes, yeah, I, you know, they're not the, getting to the world music thing. You know, there's a whole, whole world of instruments that aren't uh, traditional kind of Euro- European or American instruments that, and those are not incorporated necessarily. But yeah, you're right. It's the it's the percussion and kind of you know, maybe African inspired things that they take, um, uh, from or Caribbean. From, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That seems to be kind of what they're drawing on most, uh, so far. And the horns played more, um, jazz style. Yes. I'd say in this, it's the saxophone Yep, is the horn. But yeah, even when you look at pictures of haircut 100, they're, uh, they're a very clean cut looking band. They almost are dressed kind of like a Mormons? an 80s version <laughs> of like a 50s or 60s yeah. group you'd see on like um one of those things where they're they're playing on a sound stage kind of and they're in sweaters mm-hmm. and stuff it's um it's a very interesting um visual yeah um, aesthetic and and they're they're often called um clean um in the description i did and that is a good term for them too because even though there's a lot of sounds there's a tightness to yep. their sound as well so yeah yep, hopefully I was going to say, hopefully Matt recovers enough to, to listen to this one. Um, it's funny the, you said it because I'm like, this is, I don't <laughs> like to guess what Matt's going to think of albums, but I'm pretty comfortable to say that while we're going to give it a thumbs up, I think this one might down the road in the CTS album database that we unlisted, it's going to be a three thumbs up. But yep. I don't like, what do you think? Is that a safe bet? I think so. This it would hard, it would be hard not to like this album. <laughs> really. Yeah, exactly. Which is one of the best things you can say about an album. Like, how yeah. can you not like this album? So it's uh, it sounds like it should be easy to do, but it's not easy to make an album like that. It goes back to the Mark McGrath, uh, Mark McGrath thing from Sugar Ray when he mm. said, you know, uh, people say we're a one hit wonder, but we had two hits, and I'd like to see somebody write a one hit wonder. <laughs> never mind, it's like two a fair play. You know what I mean? Yeah, yep. easier said than done. So 